All right. Well, welcome back to the battery and system design webinars uh, being brought to you by Iron Edison and Schneider Electric. I uh, want to welcome you all back. I uh, hope you're enjoying the webinar so far. A few more questions. We're going to jump on real quick before we continue with the webinar. Uh, we had uh, one person asking about uh, replacing the electrolyte in a uh, nickel iron battery. And yes, that is something that uh, we do recommend doing, but uh, typically about every 10 years. Uh, the reason behind that is over the course of charging and discharging the battery, you're going to get a little bit of a carbonate buildup in the electrolyte. And that's going to result in a very slight degradation in its electrical capacity. Typically, we see uh, maybe about 1% uh, electrical capacity loss per year because of this. Now, by replacing the electrolyte, you're going to recover almost all of that uh, capacity loss. So um, about every 10 years or so, that's what we recommend, but it really depends on use. If uh, it's a heavy-duty industrial or utility application where you may be cycling it a couple times a day. Uh, you might do electrolyte replacement a little more frequently, maybe at year seven or eight. Uh, but, you know, uh, very casual use. Um, you could go well over 10 years. You know, there's some batteries out there that have probably never had their electrolyte replaced and still working okay, just at a diminished capacity. So hopefully that answers your question. Uh, Brandon, do you have another one to answer? We've received a couple of questions asking about the Schneider MPPT charge controllers compatibility with lithium ion or lithium iron phosphate batteries. Uh, so I would like to explain a little bit further that the charge profile for a lithium ion or lithium iron battery is very similar to a lead acid or a sealed lead acid charge algorithm. Uh, with, uh, we, we do a two-stage charge process uh, with an AC source. And when we're selling back to the grid, we will allow that charge controller, the MPPT charge controller, to advance into the third stage so that it's continuing to produce energy and sell back to the grid. Further, this, this question may be asking uh, if there is direct integration uh, between the battery management system and the, uh, the MPPT charge controllers. I'm excited to announce that in the next couple of months, our next generation battery management system will have plug and play compatibility with uh, all devices on the Zanbus network. At this point, what we're using is standard uh, lithium charge algorithms uh, and setting specific voltages that are uh, that work well with the lithium iron phosphate batteries. Those are all well within the parameters of the Schneider electric charge controllers and inverters. All of our systems are, are using this uh, to great success. We are seeing uh, no challenges or problems. Uh, with with having um, uh, with with using the Schneider Electric charge controllers uh, and our lithium iron phosphate batteries, even uh, with a nominal 52 volt lithium iron phosphate battery, as I said, the uh, the maximum charge voltage is well within the parameters. Uh, we're shooting for about 56 to 57 volts DC uh, on a lithium iron battery, well below the 64 volt maximum uh, output for a uh, 48 volt charge controller. So again, thanks for sending these detailed questions. We'd uh, love to help you now and in the future to, uh, uh, to make sure that we're designing the right system here. So uh, we have gotten, again, a number of questions. Uh, we don't have time to answer them all right now, but uh, we will respond back to your email with an answer to your question. It may take a day or two, but uh, please rest assured we are going to get all those questions answered for you. Uh, continuing on with the second half of our webinar, we're going to get into some uh, system designs and applications and uh, specifically how to program uh, the XW Plus inverter to handle a lot of these. Now, of course, getting into our system design, lawyers say we have to throw this disclaimer in here. So I want to let you know this guide is intended for anyone who needs to operate, configure, or troubleshoot the Schneider Connex or Iron Edison product lines. Uh, certain configuration tasks should only be performed by qualified personnel in consultation with your local utility and or authorized dealer. Electrical equipment should be installed, operated, serviced, and maintained only by qualified personnel. Uh, please keep unqualified personnel away from batteries. Servicing the batteries must only be performed or supervised by qualified personnel with knowledge of batteries and their required precautions. Qualified personnel will have training, knowledge, and experience in installing electrical equipment, uh, applying applicable installation codes, analyzing and reducing the uh, hazards involved in performing electrical work, installing and configuring batteries, as well as selecting and using personal protective equipment. 
No responsibility is assumed by Iron Edison or Schneider Electric for any consequences arising from the use of this material. Now that we have the lawyers happy, let's uh, talk about what we're going to be discussing here. We're going to go through samples of different system designs and applications. Um, Schneider Systems will do a wide variety of things. We're going to focus on four of them specifically. Off-grid, battery-based systems, uh, then a, a category we've seen a huge explosion of in the last few years, grid tied with battery backup, both in an AC coupled configuration as well as a DC coupled configuration. Then we're going to get into uh, grid backups applications where we don't necessarily have a solar or renewable generation component, just providing backup to the grid, as well as peak load shaving where we can significantly reduce your utility costs by uh, eliminating or reducing uh, demand charges. The first type of system that we're looking at here is an off-grid solar and battery system. Uh, what you're seeing here is how the system operates during daylight hours. The solar panels are creating DC going through the MPPT charge controller and directly charging the battery. The battery then feeds into the inverter, which takes DC direct current, turns it to AC or alternating current, which is used by your standard household appliances. During non-daylight hours, uh, nighttime or cloudy weather, what we'll see is the inverter is being fed from the battery and the inverter feeds directly to the critical load panel. The inverter will continue to draw down the battery until we reach a specific low voltage set point, at which point the inverter would call for a generator to automatically start. Uh, in this case, what we will see is the generator will fire up, run for just a couple of hours at maximum efficiency. It will charge the battery while simultaneously powering the loads. If there's a situation that arises where the amount of energy demanded by the loads uh, exceeds, uh, the, exceeds the amount going to the charger, the inverter will automatically reroute the power to the loads. We'd rather keep your lights on and your appliances running. We can save battery charging for a little bit later time. So all of this is happening internal to the inverter and uh, happens seamlessly. Next system design we're going to talk about is a grid tied with battery backup, uh, specifically in an AC coupled system. Now, there's been some confusion uh, amongst a lot of people. What's AC coupled versus DC coupled? And basically, it's how the solar array is coupled to the system. In an AC coupled system, the uh, solar array's direct current is immediately converted into alternating current, or in other words, <clears throat> again, it's coupled with the AC side of the system. An AC coupled system is very typical if, if we're we're going to be retrofitting an existing grid-tied battery-less solar system to, to add a battery backup com component. So for a quick review, uh, grid-tied solar systems, which make up roughly 90% of the solar systems on the residential level in this country, uh, our uh, DC power comes from the solar array, goes into our grid-tied string inverter, which converts it to that AC power, which then powers our loads in the home or the building with all surplus uh, solar generation backfeeding the grid for our net metering. Uh, during uh, nighttime hours, we're just utilizing that energy credit we accumulated during the daylight hours uh, to power our home from the grid. Now, if the grid goes down in a grid-tied system like this, um, the house goes down as well because um, it is a mandate by the National Electric Code that all grid interactive inverters can only be operational when qualified grid power is present. <clears throat> and this has been a, a rude awakening for a lot of people that invested in uh, grid-tied solar systems and didn't really have a full understanding of what they were getting. The first blackout they had after the system was installed, uh, the lights went off and they said, hey, what's going on? I thought uh, my solar was going to be powering the house as well. So in order to add a battery backup <clears throat> to a existing grid tied system, there's a few components we add to the loop. Uh, obviously a battery and a battery based inverter like the uh, Schneider XW plus. And we also need a separate critical loads panel. The critical loads panel is what's going to stay up if the grid goes down, because again, we cannot be interacting with the grid if the grid's not present. So during normal daylight operation, um, our solar energy is being inverted by our string inverter, feeding our critical loads. 
with the surplus power um, uh, generation continuing up into our XW plus inverter, which uh, intelligently routes that power to maintain the battery state of charge, as well as sending all surplus energy back into our main loads panel and ultimately out to the grid for our net metering. Should we lose the grid during daylight hours, uh, the XW Plus is going to see the grid went away and go into its uh, island mode where it's going to disconnect the main loads. Your main load panel is going to go dark. Uh, however, it will continue to keep the critical loads panel up and running uh, as well as tricking the uh, string inverter into thinking the grid is still present. And by doing that, our solar production will continue even though the grid isn't there anymore. Now, uh, there is always going to be an imbalance between solar production and our loads on the critical loads panel. Sometimes we'd be producing more solar than we're using. Other times we may be using more energy than we're producing. The XW Plus inverter is going to monitor uh, this and instantly and, const and consistently um, uh, manage those loads by either absorbing the surplus energy production from the array and putting it into the battery to charge it up or using battery power to supplement any deficiencies uh, in the loads uh, based on the solar production. Now, if we find ourselves in a place where the battery is full and we don't have any place to store or absorb that excess solar production, what the XW Plus is going to do is utilize a frequency shifting algorithm where it's going to slightly modify that 60 hertz sine wave it's pushing back into the critical loads panel and that the string inverter is seeing. It might deviate that down to maybe 59.5 or 59 hertz, uh, just enough for that string inverter to disqualify that power, it's going to say, wait, the grid power is inconsistent and clean. I'm going to shut down, uh, effectively shutting down our solar production. At that point, we'll power our critical loads exclusively from the battery and at the same time discharge the battery enough so that we have enough headroom, if you will, so that uh, we can have a, a place to absorb that um, excess solar production. When we get to that point, the XW Plus is going to shift that uh, out output back to 60 hertz exactly. Our string inverter will see that, uh, requalify that power, and resume its so uh, solar production. So there's this constant push-pull relationship uh, that the XW Plus is uh, um, utilizing to manage um, the solar production and keep the critical loads uh, output exactly where it should be. Now, in uh, nighttime operation, the grid's up. Uh, we're going to be utilizing the energy credit from our net metering, and that is going to be powering our main loads panel. And if you want to configure it to do so, we can have the XW Plus inverter use the top portion of our battery capacity to power a critical load. So you're not using uh, as much energy from the grid. Uh, it'll discharge down to a point we define, so we have a nice reserve or battery backup should the grid go down. Uh, then once uh, we've reached that point, we want to maintain that reserve. So the XW Plus will then utilize grid power to uh, continue to power the critical loads. And if need be, and if we have a program to do so, we can use grid power to uh, recharge the battery as well. If we lose the grid during uh, nighttime hours, again, the main loads are going to go down. Obviously, we have no solar production. So uh, the XW Plus is going to lean exclusively on the battery to uh, power our critical loads. The next type of system we're going to look at here is the grid tie with battery backup in a DC coupled system. The DC coupled system is the preferred uh, method for any new solar system. In a DC coupled system, we have the PV array's direct current directly connected to the battery bank that's able to store that direct current. So in other words, uh, the DC is coupled to the battery side of the system. This is the type of system that I operate at my house, uh, DC coupled grid tie battery backup with net metering. What you see here is an example of what would be happening during a typical daylight uh, hours here in Colorado. The solar charging the battery through the MPPT charge controller. The, uh, the energy will first go to power the critical loads and then uh, any excess solar production is going to be fed back upstream to the main load panel and then back out to the grid. If we see the grid go down, which we've seen several times here in the last couple of months, uh, we don't even skip a beat. The inverter will detect that the grid has gone down. It will disconnect itself from the main load panel, from the grid, uh, using anti-islanding technology, and the system will continue to operate, drawing energy from the solar panels through the battery, through the inverter to power the critical loads. 
during non-daylight hours. Now we see the grid return, uh, but the battery may be low because it's nighttime. So uh, what we see in this situation is that the grid is coming in, uh, feeding the main load panel, feeding all the appliances in the house. Uh, the inverter will pass through uh, the grid power to keep the critical loads uh, online and powered up. Optionally, we'll see the inverter start to charge the battery if required and uh, get that battery ready for another potential grid outage. If we do see that grid outage now at nighttime, uh, as we see here in this slide, what's happening, the battery is the sole source of stored energy. Uh, the inverter takes that DC from the battery and converts it to AC and will supply the critical load panel. Next uh, um, system we're going to talk about is a grid backup system. This is a situation where we'll be providing a battery backup to protect critical loads from a grid outage, or in other words, it's basically a UPS or uninterruptible power supply. Uh, under normal uh, grid backup operations, we have the grid up. First of all, you'll notice we don't have the uh, solar ge generation component here. Uh, you can have that if you want. It's not mandatory for this particular operation. In this example, all of our power will be coming from the grid, first powering our main loads. Then the XW Plus <clears throat> is going to use the uh, grid power that it needs to power our critical loads as well as maintaining the battery. While it's doing all that, it's also going to be monitoring that grid power, not just the fact that it's there, but the quality of it. Uh, we can uh, define a window of what's acceptable voltage and acceptable frequency from the grid. So not only if we lose the grid, but if uh, the grid power deviates outside of that window, uh, the XW Plus will see that, instantly disconnect from the grid, and continue to power our critical loads exclusively from the battery. And this transition can typically happen in less than one cycle, or less than one sixtieth of a second, which is ideal for your critical loads. Um, handy for uh, data center applications or really anytime you have very sensitive mission critical equipment that uh, needs to be powered 24-7. If we find ourselves in a situation where the power outage is going to last longer than the battery capacity, don't forget we can pl plug a generator into the XW Plus inverter and by leveraging the abilities of the auto gen start, once the battery state of charge drops down to a level we define, that'll trigger the generator to automatically start up. And while the generator's running, the generator power will be routed to our critical loads to give them first priority and keep them up and running with any surplus power production from the generator being used to recharge the battery. Once the battery is fully charged, the AGS will uh, see that, tell the generator to shut down, and we'll just continue operating on the battery until either the battery discharges to that point again or the grid uh, returns. This last type of application that we're going to look at today is called peak load shaving. And the goal here is to reduce demand charges, which is typically seen in a uh, commercial or business utility bill. Uh, peak demand charges are, are um, put upon businesses to reduce the total amount of energy drawn at one moment in time. The reason why utilities put uh, demand charges in place is to help uh, businesses control the instantaneous draw of energy uh, coming into a commercial complex. So they do this by, uh, by charging a, a business uh, a, a accelerated rate based on the highest instantaneous draw measured over a billing period. So in addition to the standard uh, kilowatt hours or total energy consumed over the course of a month that we're used to seeing from our utility bills at home, uh, on, a, on, a, uh, on a business or commercial uh, bill, you would see the addition of demand charges. These demand charges can represent up to 40% of a company's monthly utility bill. So the Schneider system presents us with a unique opportunity to significantly re reduce monthly energy expenditures uh, by delivering and, and controlling those peak demands uh, by delivering that energy from a battery-based system. Here, solar and generator are optional. Uh, typically, that energy uh, is charged into the battery from the grid at a low rate off peak hours and then dumped at a very high rate when those uh, motors, uh, refrigerators, uh, or other heavy-duty machinery starts up and uh, draws a significant amount of energy from the grid. 
Um, a, a quick example, a thousand watt motor may draw uh, 3000 watts or more uh, as that motor begins to spin. So if you have a really heavy duty, like a 10 horsepower motor uh, that's drawing thousands of watts over normal operation, it can draw tens of thousands of watts uh, during startup. And that's what we're looking to cover, small peaks of high demand. Here's an example uh, showing uh, no load uh, up to full load. And in the middle is the Schneider set point uh, called load shave amps. Above this set point, load shave amps. Uh, this sets the maximum amount of current that can be drawn from the grid to the loads. Uh, this setting determines the amperage level at which the inverter starts drawing power from the batteries to add to the utility power in order to meet the demands of the loads. This first amount of energy is supplied by the grid. Beyond that, the next amount of energy is supplied by the battery and solar. So we're not looking to totally reduce uh, energy consumed from the grid to zero. We're just looking to cover those sharp peaks uh, and reduce costs through a mid-sized battery system. Here's an example of how that peak load shaving system is designed. Uh, here we have the grid feeding the critical load panel through the inverter. In this example, uh, the load shave amps is set to 30, above which uh, any more power will be delivered by the battery and inverter. When a 45 amp load comes on the load panel, uh, 30 amps will continue to come from the grid, while 15 amps will come from the battery system. When that load decreases from 45 now down to 15 amps, what's going to happen is the load will be supplied. Uh, we're below the, below the setting of load shave amps. So the battery, if needed, will start to recharge slowly and we will, uh, we will supply the load from the grid. Uh, if the load decreases further and the battery is full, there's simply a 15 amp load on the system. The battery is standing by fully charged at 100% and the system is ready to shave that next uh, peak. In this next section, we're going to jump into the settings and programming of the Schneider XW Plus inverter. This is the last uh, group of, um, of slides that we have for you today, so we really appreciate uh, everybody hanging out with us this afternoon. And uh, again, please send us any questions that you have to info at ironedison.com. We're going to jump into the nitty gritty details here. You can see a picture of all the different settings. I know it's really small. We had to cram all those settings into the uh, to this one slide here. Uh, this is just the controls uh, for the XW Plus inverter. Uh, we're going to show you how all these set points work together before we start examining in detail each of these slot uh, each of these settings. So. Uh, in this scenario where the battery is discharging, we want to protect the inverter and protect the battery from over discharge. So what we're going to see here is all the different ways the inverter can be programmed or the system can be programmed to protect the battery from over discharge. So uh, in the first scenario, we have the battery discharging. We're going to hit the solar recharge volts. If there's still sun, in the sky, the charge controllers will be programmed to automatically initiate a new charge cycle. If there's no sun and the battery continues to discharge, the battery will descend to the grid support volts point. It's at this point where the grid would typically come in, support the loads on the critical, critical load panel, keep your lights on, keep your appliances on, and we can set this so that we can keep 50, 60, 70 percent of the battery capacity remaining if you expect a grid outage. Uh, this setting is also used for how much energy we want to sell back to the grid, but it's important to note here that, that we can work with you to design uh, these set points to, to keep a lot of energy in a battery. If you have frequent outages, maybe we want to keep only 50% of battery capacity overnight if you have infrequent grid outages. If uh, per chance the grid is not available or we have DC loads on the battery, we're not automatically going to start a charge at this point, but if the battery continues to discharge, we'll reach the inverter recharge volts. It's at this lower set point that the inverter will automatically initiate a new charge cycle when an AC source is reapplied. That would be a grid or generator. So uh, we would call typically for the grid to recharge the battery first, 
but we're assuming in this example that neither the sun uh, nor the grid is present and the battery is going to continue to discharge. It's at this lower generator call to start voltage set point that we would see the gen start. We've already crossed a threshold below which the inverter will start to charge the battery. And it's at this point that that's really one of our last resorts. We, uh, we would rely on the generator to recharge the battery and get it up to a higher level. If the, there's no generator, no grid and no sun, we can still keep using the battery all the way down to the low battery cutout level. It's below this level that the inverter will uh, stop powering loads from the battery and will uh, protect the battery from over discharge. So there's several layers of uh, failover, if you will, here, and these are not settings that are set in stone. Uh, each one of these settings is custom configurable to your exact needs and uh, requirements. You know, if you don't have the grid at all, we may have the generator start uh, a little bit sooner and, uh, you know, vice versa. So again, you know, need to reiterate that these are certainly not set in stone set points, custom configurable, every single one you independently uh, define so you can uh, have the system perfectly dialed in for your needs. Exactly right. So uh, we're going to jump into the settings uh, shown in that menu map. The first group of settings we're going to look at is the inverter settings. This is a screenshot of what you'd see from the system control panel. This is exactly where we'll set those levels uh, specific for your system, for your battery, battery chemistry and, and application. Low battery cutout and delay, as well as low battery cutout hysteresis. These settings allow us to, uh, these would allow you to, uh, to apply a heavy load to the battery when it was at a low state of charge. Uh, an example would be starting an air conditioner or starting a well pump that would draw a lot of energy out of the battery. If we have a long delay there, more than 10 seconds or 20 seconds, uh, once we get that pump up and running, the load will decrease and the battery voltage may climb back above the low battery cutout level. So we don't wanna instantaneously cut out the power going to the load. Uh, but we want to give it a little bit of time. High battery cutout allows uh, the inverter to self-protect in case there's an overcharge scenario. And uh, search watts is a really interesting setting that can be used in a number of ways. First of all, uh, with one inverter, search watts can be used if, if you don't have a lot of loads on the system. We can uh, decrease the phantom load of the inverter from 28 watts to 8 watts. But where this setting really shines is with a multi-inverter configuration. The way that we would program this is to turn off search on the master or the uh, first inverter. The second and third inverters in the system, we would leave search watts active. So what happens when, uh, when the, uh, the inverters operate at uh, an efficiency that, that's around 60 to 90% of their rated capacity? When we, when we use this special configuration, we can have the first inverter cover all the loads up to about 60% of the 6,800 watts. Above that level, the second inverter will kick on and start to help the first inverter to cover the loads. The third inverter would kick on only when needed when the first and second inverters are reaching their 60% of maximum output. This is kind of a cascading on and off feature that allows the inverters to operate at maximum efficiency. As the load decreases, the third inverter would shut down the second inverter, leaving that first inverter to operate at maximum efficiency. Conversely, we may have some applications. Uh, we're designing a system right now for a farmer that has very heavy pumping needs. We would disable search on all three inverters. All three inverters would be ready to go at any moment. We would sacrifice a little bit of extra draw by keeping these inverters on all the time. But what that's going to allow this, this uh, family to do is uh, as soon as that pump operates, all three inverters are going to be there uh, ready to go to power the load. So you can see we can really uh, work the programming to, uh, to fit those specific needs. The next group of settings, this is the battery charger. So this is specific to the inverter when the inverter is charging to, from the grid or from the generator. There's a different group of settings similar uh, in the MPPT charge controllers that is controlling the DC charging from the solar array. So uh, what you see here is we, we have the set points for the battery charger in the XW plus inverter. We're allowed to select the battery type. And when we select a custom or lithium ion battery type, it unlocks other submenus, which allow us to control 
bulk absorb float voltage and temperature compensation. Where these set points uh, really shine is the, the second group, the lithium ion settings. What Schneider has done here is allowed us to control not only the voltage at each of the charge stages, but the current going into the battery at each of the different charge stages. This is unique to Schneider Electric, uh, and we really applaud them for uh, delivering these cutting edge features as battery technology continues to advance. So uh, we're using these set points uh, differently on small versus large batteries, uh, especially to control the current, uh, to, to taper the current during the bulk phase uh, and ramp that current up uh, during the absorb phase. Uh, you can also see we have a uh, basically a surge current max that's at the bottom right discharge current max or discharge i max uh, which allows us to program the percent capacity that we can surge as well as a timer again this would be useful for starting up an air conditioner or a heavy load where we can draw a lot of energy quickly from a lithium battery uh, but not so long as to damage the battery uh, back on the left-hand side, you can see we can program in battery capacity, the maximum charge rate of the whole system. We can set, uh, we typically set the, uh, the inverter to charge with a two-stage process, bulk and absorb. That's where most of the charging ha is happening. We don't want to waste extra gas in the generator uh, from doing just a small trickle float charge. You can see the uh, battery temperature, which is used when there's no battery temperature sensor installed and the recharge volts, which we discussed before in its relationship with grid support volts. This is where the inverter will be programmed to initiate a new charge. Uh, we also see at the bottom charge blocks start and stop. If, uh, if you live in an area where there's uh, different rates for different times of day, we can control when the battery charges. Next item in the uh, menu map are the AC settings, and that's basically where we're defining the parameters for the two AC inputs on the XW Plus inverter. First, we have the AC priority, which is uh, telling the inverter which AC source to use first when we need to fail over to an AC source. And then for both AC1 and AC2, we, uh, it wants to know what size of the breaker is so it knows how much energy it can pull in from that particular uh, interface and make sure we don't have any nuisance, tri nuisance tripping by uh, pulling more than what the uh, breaker is rated for. Uh, earlier when I was talking about uh, the uh, battery backup uh, application, where if the uh, power was uh, got outside of a voltage win you, window that you defined, this is where you set that up. You define what the lowest acceptable and highest acceptable voltage is uh, from either the grid on AC1 or the generator on AC2, as well as the frequency. So you set this up based on what your loads are and if they are you know, very sensitive loads that need exact precise voltage or if you can deviate a little bit. And the nice thing is you can set each um, AC1 and AC2 independently of each other. Uh, typically, generators uh, will deviate a bit more, and so you can set them differently than you can from the uh, AC input one from the grid. The next group of settings we're going to look at is grid support. So under the grid support settings, uh, we have grid support volts, above which this setting we're going to be selling energy back to the grid. Below this setting, uh, we are going to use the grid to support uh, the critical loads. We can control if cell is enabled or disabled. We can also control the maximum amount of energy being sold back to the grid. This measurement, uh, 20 amp, 28 amps, uh, the default parameter, uh, we typically set this to be a little bit less than what a customer's solar array size would be, just to account for any solar inefficiencies. Uh, the reason why we do this is we don't want to sell more energy than the solar array is able to produce. In this scenario, what we'd be doing is actually selling energy that's stored in the battery that we'd be looking to use later in, in the evening. Here you can see we can also independently control load shave and the amount of load shave amps. This is the level above which the inverter and battery will deliver uh, to the loads. You can see that uh, we have load shave start and stop times but we also have cell block start and stop times. These set points allow us to tell the inverter exactly when to start and stop selling power to the grid. We can use this in a couple of ways. Uh, we can stop selling energy to the grid in the middle of the afternoon if we want to really charge up our battery going into the evening. 
take advantage of a little bit of net metering, but really go into the night with a full state of charge. Uh, we can also use this uh, in an example with, uh, with different time of use rates. That's uh, a optional program here in Colorado. We'll take a look at that next. The uh, cell to grid voltage, this is where we are gonna see uh, the grid support volt set point come into play, above which we're going to be selling power to the grid. Uh, here you can see that typical bell curve of solar production. In the morning, the battery voltage rises above the grid support volt set point. We're selling power to the grid throughout the afternoon. And then when the battery crosses below that threshold, uh, we will use power from the grid or use a little bit of battery power before the grid takes over. Now this is where things get fun. Uh, we can use cell block start and stop to allow for the selling of energy during periods at which we're gonna get more money from selling back to the grid. So utilities are rolling out these new complicated rate structures here in Colorado, these, uh, I drew these numbers at the bottom, four cents uh, for buying and selling electricity during non-peak hours and 13 cents per kilowatt hour for buying and selling during on-peak hours. You can see the peak hours are from 2 p.m. until 6 p.m. This is when people are getting home, uh, starting their air conditioner, starting to cook dinner, opening their refrigerators. There's a lot of electricity being used from the grid. And also we're seeing the sun start to set during this period so any renewable production is starting to decrease. During these times, we can set the Schneider Electric Inverter to prevent selling before 2 p.m., start selling at exactly 2 p.m. in one second, and sell all the way until 6 o'clock p.m. We can maximize our return on investment. We can control the amount of energy being sold back and really take advantage of these rate structures. So as these sorts of programs continue to roll out in areas, we can adjust the set points to meet those needs. The next group of settings we're gonna look at is the auxiliary settings. Auxiliary settings are built into each device on the Schneider Electric ZAN bus network, each inverter, charge controller, AGS, uh, they all have auxiliary ports that we can use to control external devices. Uh, these ex, uh, these auxil auxiliary terminals give us 12 volts and 250 milliamps to control an external relay, contactor. Uh, there's so many different things that we can do. In this application, that, that the default settings would be telling us that, that the aux port is not turned on manually, but rather is being uh, done automatically as the battery passes below 42 volts. When the battery goes below 42 volts for one second, the auxiliary terminals will activate. This would be used for sound, sounding an external low voltage alarm or signal light. The clear level and clear delay show us when that uh, signal alarm or light may be turned off. So as the battery voltage climbs above 48 volts for one second, that warning light would clear. The aux ports, really, uh, how you can utilize these is really only limited by your imagination. Uh, the trigger source can be low battery voltage, high battery voltage, uh, low or high battery temperature, as well as a fault. So um, if your battery is getting low, I mean, you know, we could use it for uh, load shaving applications where we can maybe have it activate a contactor to shut down your air conditioner or certain loads so the battery drops down to a certain level or uh, uh, turn on an indicator light or sound an alarm of some type. Say, for example, you do not have an auto gen start, but you need to go out and start the generator. You can use this to, uh, you know, sound an alarm of some type telling you, okay, you need to, you know, sh shut off some loads and or go out start, go outside and fire up that manual pull generator. So again, you know, really, uh, the your your own imagination is the uh, limit as to how you can utilize these auxiliary um, ports. And again, every single device on the network is going to have at least one one of these auxiliary ports and each one is configured independently of each other. So if you've got uh, say two inverters and four charge controllers, I think you'll have six auxiliary ports. Each one can be assigned a specific task with its own specific settings. The next group of settings we're gonna look at is the multi-unit configuration. This is really important when we're doing a multi-cluster uh, multi system or a multi-inverter multi-charge controller system. Uh, it's really important on the Zambus network to give each device its own number. The device name setting is really cosmetic only. Uh, in this example, we may say inverter left, middle, and right. Uh, this is just for reporting and monitoring. 
changing the name of each device isn't going to, to do more than, than just change its name on the display. What's really important here is giving each device its own number or else we'll see a system-wide fault occur. Uh, in a split phase configuration, 122 40 volt configuration, we would have uh, the inverter mode would be set to split phase master for the first unit and then split phase slave for inverters two and three. Uh, we would also assign a unique ID to the com box and to the, uh, the each charge controller on the network. Uh, the connections submenu is really important for multi-cluster. That means multiple groups of inverters. So we may have uh, a group, two groups of three inverters, each connected to their own battery, each connected to their own generator. Through this menu, we can tell the system that uh, the first group is connected to the first set of batteries, the second group of inverters to the second battery, and uh, each set of inverters is connected to its own generator. So uh, depending on the configuration, we'll come in here and, and change exactly how these devices are named and uh, what, what they're connected to on the network. The last group of settings we're going to cover today is the advanced settings. These are typically used by installers uh, really during the setup, uh, but it is worth covering here. We do have the option for uh, remote power off function. This, uh, this setting enables an external switch connected to the XW Plus auxiliary port. Uh, this can come in really handy um, for a rapid shutdown type of application or if you have some type of a security system and say a fire alarm has gone off or something like that. Uh, with this setting, if it's turned on, we can utilize one of the aux uh, inputs on uh, the inverter or any system, any component on the Zambus network to initiate a shutdown uh, should uh, we receive that input. So if there's an emergent situation, again, you know, rapid shutdown, a fireman has showed up and triggered your rapid shutdown system or you know, fire alarms, uh, whatever input you want can initiate uh, the system to shut off. The next setting, power save, uh, will change the output voltage of the inverter from 240 volts to 220 volts as long as the load is less than 100 watts. Uh, the standard appliances use 120 volts per leg or 240 volts overall, but they can operate without a problem at 110 or 220 volts AC. Uh, this will disable or, or save you a little bit of energy uh, in those situations where you don't want to be running at full power on uh, with a small load. Cell delay uh, at 40 seconds is, to, is disabled by default. The default is a cell delay of 20 seconds. If the battery voltage drops below um, the cell to grid volts or the grid support volts, it'll typically reconnect and start selling within 20 seconds. But if you have a, a battery with heavy loads and there's a lot of variation in the voltage, you may want to delay uh, the, the selling back to grid period up to 40 seconds. AC coupling is the next setting. This is recommended to keep the setting enabled by default. Uh, this is where uh, we're going to enable the capability of frequency shifting, uh, but it just really allows the inverter to operate a little bit more efficiently uh, in both an AC and DC coupled application. So, don't be fooled by this one. I've been fooled in the past, but as I said, don't be fooled and turn off AC coupling just because you have a DC coupled uh, inverter system. Really, the only time you'd want to turn this off is, you, is if you have very sensitive electronics on the output of the inverter that need exactly 60.0 hertz sine wave. Um, otherwise, like, like Brandon said, uh, go ahead and uh, leave this enabled. Just lets the inverter operate a little bit more efficiently. Next option on here is battery balance, which is a really neat feature I've, I've discovered. If you have a larger system with multiple inverters and uh, you have a large uh, battery storage need, typically you would have to wind up paralleling multiple strings of batteries which isn't in an ideal situation just due to keeping the ba uh, each battery in the in this uh, array balanced. What you can do with this feature is each inverter in a multi-inverter situation can have its own dedicated battery bank. And by using the battery monitor, uh, the system is going to monitor the percent state of charge of each battery on each inverter and then adjust the load on each inverter to keep all the batteries in the system balanced. So it really um, expands the possibility of doing larger arrays with larger, higher capacity battery banks. The external contact uh, feature is used in multi-cluster configurations. 
We're going to be setting a system up like this next week when we install the uh, 3200 amp hour battery with a nine inverter cluster. We'll keep everybody uh, in the loop and send you some photos and information about this very large system. Uh, the external contact is uh, in an external enclosure and allows the system to safely disconnect from the grid uh, when we're running off grid with a large battery system. Peak load shave delay and TOV disconnect are the last two uh, inverter uh, advanced settings. I'd like to look at the TOV disconnect, which is transient over voltage. Uh, last night I was at a, a Senate committee hearing uh, talking about uh, the uh, safety and operation of the system uh, in a configuration where it's tied to the grid. Somebody from the utility expressed concern that as the, the voltage on the system rises, then uh, the inverter may not shut off. Um, this was a concern in Hawaii. The Hawaii Electric Company uh, put in a tariff rule that said the inverter must shut off very, very quickly when it senses an over voltage event. So uh, built into the inverter is the capability to, uh, to isolate itself from the grid uh, in, in a fraction of a second. So uh, that wraps up all of the settings that we have uh, in the XW Plus inverter. Not necessarily all the settings in the inverter. I mean, this is really the Swiss army knife of inverters, if you will. We just uh, touched on uh, a number of settings that we thought would be relevant to talk about, but there's quite a few more settings and operations, configurations, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, if you have any uh, you know, unique challenges or projects, um, we're more than happy to uh, give you a hand with designing and uh, coming up with the ideal best solution for whatever that project may be, you know, using uh, Schneider equipment, uh, nickel iron batteries, lithium iron batteries, or really whatever tool or asset is needed to accomplish your ultimate goals. I think we might have uh, one or two more questions we have time for. We went a little bit over, so we're going to hit just a couple of these questions. But uh, please remember that if you emailed us a question, we are going to respond back to you. We're, we'll re answer every single question we received. But we're going to hit one or two more before we wrap up here. Go ahead, Brandon. The question is, uh, does the system have an automatic method to control the amount of battery used each night, i.e., I'd not like my battery to go below 50%. Uh, this is for a 9-kilowatt system in a 1,600-square-foot house with no generator. Any pointers on this? Absolutely, yes. You can define, um, you know, through the various voltage settings, how much you'll discharge the battery before it uh, does whatever the next action that you may want. So if you're a, you know, grid-tied battery backup, we can uh, discharge the battery down to about 50%. And once it hits that particular point, we can use the uh, grid support feature, where at that point we'll stop using the battery, uh, start using the grid power in a pass-through mode. Uh, we're not going to charge the battery from the grid because there's really no point in uh, paying for energy when we can get it for free from your solar array later uh, and the next day or whatever. So um, yes, you can certainly do that. That's no problem at all. That's one of the many features that uh, the system has. Uh, maybe time for one more question, Brandon? Sure. This question uh, asks, is the Iron Edison lithium iron better battery better than the Tesla Powerwall? Does it allow for more backup capacity? Well, the answer to this question is yes, of course it's better than the Tesla Powerwall. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, the Iron Edison battery is designed from the ground up to be a, a system to support a whole house or a whole business. Although we do have some smaller batteries, what separates us is the fact that we are designing batteries, a single battery that has a high amp, amp hour capacity. Uh, the Tesla Powerwall is limited to eight or 10 kilowatt hours of total capacity. We can parallel a couple of these units together, but there's definitely some restrictions on the way that, that the Tesla Powerwall is installed. For example, the Tesla Powerwall is typically tied in directly to the main load panel. If the grid were to go down and the battery takes over, uh, there that, that one or two Tesla Powerwall batteries could be drained very quickly, uh, especially uh, because we are not we're not putting in a critical load panel into the design. Essentially, every circuit of the house is going to be backed up by a small battery. In houses with an air conditioner and a couple refrigerators, we would be able, you would be able to drain that Tesla power wall in just a couple of hours. So 
um, we really appreciate what Tesla and many of the other competitors are doing. They're bringing a lot of light to the market. They're bringing a lot of energy and they're really helping people to understand uh, why solar and battery systems are important. We feel that we have a superior design. We're offering a higher energy, a, a higher capacity battery uh, that's custom designed to fit every application. So uh, we really appreciate that question. We get questions like that quite a lot. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a really exciting time to be in the energy storage business designing systems. Couple more quick ones I'm going to try and squeeze in here. First of all, um, someone's asking about using a water deionizer, uh, specifically the one from Philadelphia Scientific for our nickel iron batteries. And actually, the, apps, the answer to that is yes, we do carry that uh, deionizer. Uh, we've uh, put it through some extensive testing and it'll work very well. It'll uh, produce uh, the exact uh, precise um, quality of water that we need to uh, water the nickel iron battery. So if you're in a situation where um, you know, you're running down to the grocery store and buying gallon jugs of distilled water is just not practical either economically or due to distance in your location. By all means, uh, you can get a deionizer, use your local water source to uh, make your own water for the batteries. In fact, above and beyond that, um, Philadelphia Scientific will offer a uh, free water testing service. If you're considering getting the uh, deionizer, you can send a sample of your water to Philadelphia Scientific. They're going to send you back a report uh, showing the total dissolved solids in your water and give you an estimate as to how many gallons of water you can expect to get from each of the filter cartridges on that uh, deionizer. So yes, that's definitely a great option. Uh, one more question. Can the Combox uh, data be accessed without a wireless router in Android device? Uh, this gentleman has no internet connection and would prefer a hardwire method of data acquisition. The Combox actually has an Ethernet port, an RJ45 plug on it. Um, so uh, you will need, you know, if, if you're good with IT and routing, you can, uh, you know, give your laptop a static IP address give a static IP to your uh, comm box and just have a direct cable between your computer and the comm box. Uh, to make it a little bit easier, you can have a router of some type, you know, like a Linksys or D-Link router. Uh, you don't necessarily need internet connectivity to do that. Uh, if you can get a network connection between whatever device you have and the comm box, you have full access and control of the system uh, locally without using the internet at all. Um, internet access, um, as we said earlier, the comm box will, you know, phone home, as we say, and upload its data Data. It's a read-only upload to Schneider's um, servers, and then you log into Schneider's website just to monitor um, the uh, performance of your system. You can't make any configuration changes uh, in this method. Only the only way you can make conf configuration changes via the com box is on the local network. And uh, Brandon, one more question uh, you can tackle about AC coupling and generator. Ooh, this is a good one. Uh, in an AC coupled grid tie and battery backup system. Can a generator also be connected? In other words, are the grid and AC solar array taking both the AC1 and AC2 inputs, thus not allowing for a third AC input, the generator, uh, to be connected? Or do we have the capability of connecting a generator in an AC coupled battery backup system? The answer is yes, we can use a generator in an AC coupled system. Uh, in this configuration, the solar inverter is landing on the AC1 terminal and passing energy back out to the grid uh, through the grid input terminal. The AC2 terminal, which is reserved solely for the generator, when the generator comes on, the inverter will sense this. And the challenge uh, with typically running a generator and an AC coupled array is that uh, the generator could be backfed by the solar array, which could cause significant damage to the components of the generator. So we have to separate those two inputs. If we see the generator come online, the uh, solar inverter would disconnect, uh, the frequency of the, uh, of the output would, be, would disconnect the solar array from, uh, from the critical load panel, and the generator could charge the battery and keep that critical load panel active. So you know, we really appreciate all of these questions. Uh,
We have had just a, a plethora of questions uh, coming in, and uh, unfortunately, we're a bit over time, so we're going to need to wrap things up. If you do have more questions, uh, please uh, drop us a line, uh, info at ironedison.com, or if you have a, um, a specific project you want to talk about, or if you just want to talk to a human being instead of uh, sending an email, uh, please give us a ring. We've got a full team of system designers uh, standing by, ready and waiting to talk to you. Uh, our phone number is uh, area code 720 432-6433. And then when you uh, call that number, just press one right away and uh, you'll get forwarded to one of our uh, system designers. And again, uh, our email address, info at ironedison.com. Either one of those is a great uh, conduit to get in touch with us to uh, get any questions you have answered or help with any projects that you may have. I'd like to thank everybody. This has been by far the largest live audience we've ever had for a presentation here at Iron Edison. We wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for you uh, being a part of the Iron Edison family. It really means a lot to me personally uh, with how many people have uh, uh, supported our company. And, and I just want to thank you again. Um, we are always happy to help and look forward to hearing from you soon. Thank you so much.